The relation of science and faith has been of interest to me since high school, when the class play Inherit the Wind provided a vivid but not unbiased view of the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial in Dayton, Tennessee. Later, as a student at Pepperdine, I spent the price of seven tacos at Taco Bell, or maybe skimping by not buying a couple more bars of soap at Ralph's, to purchase Causality and Chance in Modern Physics for a dollar and thirty-five cents at the Pepperdine bookstore. I wanted to be sure the weird stuff in quantum mechanics did not make the principle of causality go away. It doesn't. Here's the book. It's still in my bookshelf. Fifty years later, one book a dollar thirty-five, seven tacos a dollar and thirty-three cents, nineteen sixty-four. Everything was all okay, even with quantum mechanics. The author and foreword author assured that causality is still at the heart of science. After that, I never went much further in the book. I just wanted to make sure, since that causality principle seemed to apply to a lot of stuff. Fast forward from 1964 to 2014. That's 50 years. For most of that half century, I had been following the creation, evolution, faith, science conflicts and becoming increasingly involved. So in May 2014, when my wife and I cruised from Oregon down to L.A. to catch a few of the Pepperdine Bible lectures, enjoy the time away from the rat race, and maybe see a few old friends, naturally I gravitated to the faith science lecture sequence that had been arranged. I was stunned. I felt like I had landed on a different planet. Or maybe our modest Toyota Corolla had put us into warp drive and transmitted us to an alien universe. The lectures were loaded with rhetorical gymnastics to somehow get the Bible record of origins to match up with the current evolution scientism nonsense. This was the same up and down the line in the seven lectures from six speakers. I was flabbergasted. Long story short, just two of the many outrageous examples of eisegesis follow. Eisegesis? That's the opposite of exegesis. Exegesis means you read the text to try to get the meaning out of it, Eisegesis means reading into a text something that simply is not there. First, why did the Pepperdine faculty and guest speakers seem to be going north in the southbound lane of truth-seeking? Their search to somehow find Bible support for the evolutionary narrative meant the Bible portrayal of man made in the image of God must somehow be diminished to gloss over the Bible's impassable chasm between man and animal to grease the rails for evolution's transition tale from ape-like creature to homo sapiens. Sadly, this meant repeating Satan's work of driving a wedge between man and God by, number one, moving us, humankind, away from the glorious inherent sonship, dignity, and value proclaimed in Genesis and affirmed at the cross, and, secondly, moving us closer to brotherhood with simians, that is, ape-like creatures. And by the way, hearing Professor Chris Hurd sing the blasphemous Ode to Australopithecus, a cappella to the tune of Amazing Grace, no less, was an uncontested, unthinkable low among Bible classes I had ever attended, and this from a tenured university Bible scholar. Frankly, it was just, it was so vile I could never include it among the following illustrative clips. And here's the first. Humanity takes charge of the rest of creation as a reflection of God's greater rule. So humanity takes charge of the earthly creatures as a reflection of God's greater rule over all that exists. Two very important implications of this are, first, that Genesis 1 binds humanity and divinity very closely together. Specifically in that both take charge of other creatures. So the second important point, which flows from that, is... And this is so important. In Genesis 1, 26 through 28, the image of God is not an attribute. It is a job description. It is not an attribute. It's a job description. But in Genesis 2, the job description is a little bit different. Genesis 2, 5 suggests that God's motive for creating an earthling in Genesis 2-7 is to provide someone to till or farm the land, depending on what translation you're looking at. And in Genesis 2-15, God puts that human in the Garden of Eden to, quote, till it and keep it or farm it and take care of it. Well, it's hard for me to even find words to respond. 
the Genesis texts defining the glory of man as made in the image of God are so obvious that the only thing more obvious is that Dr. Hurd's machinations to diminish man are merely futile flailings of a man desperate to, to, to what and why. This is wrong at just so many levels. First, man made in the image of God affirms both our fitness for intimate relationship with him and our purpose for relationship with him. The core message of the Bible and the core message of the cross at the center of the Bible. Secondly, Dr. Hurd suggests man was created for the land. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 18 affirms the land was made for man, saying, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, there is none else. And so, here's the next clip. So we need to recognize that just as that, that God is showing a great deal of concern in Genesis 2 and 3 for keeping humanity and divinity distant, separate, distinct. So just as soon as Genesis 1 introduces the idea that humanity bears the image of God, Genesis 2 comes along and pushes back against that idea by trying to trace out some of its limits. Sort of asking, how far are you going to take that notion? How far are you going to push the resemblance between God and humanity. But Genesis 2 goes even farther than that in connecting humans more closely with animals than with divinities. And I don't know any better word than divinities to include God, angels, whatever. So as Dr. Hurd says... God is showing a great deal of concern in Genesis in keeping humanity and divinity distant, separate, distinct. Dr. Hurd misses the main point of God's word as Dr. Hurd tries to slide man toward monkeydom. Here's the truth. Yes, God must keep fallen humanity distant from divinity because God is holy. Yes, God must keep sinfulness and holiness distant. Yet God seeks to bring humanity and divinity back to the created intimateness of the Garden of Eden as God went seeking man, saying, Where are you? And as Jesus affirmed, I go to prepare a place for you, so that where I am, you may be also. This is the story of the Bible. God keeps the sinful and the holy separate, while he yet reconciles the sinful one and the holy one. How could Dr. Hurd miss this point most fundamental to the Bible and to the cross of Jesus? Do you really want to know if the idea of theistic evolution is compatible with the Genesis record provided for us by God? You may look further at a variety of science issues on the True Science for Theologians website or many other resources available. But you know, you really need go no further than to just observe the desperate agonized twisting and resting of scripture such as the two clips we've just heard to know the answer. Genesis is not at all compatible with the simian to man narrative of both the secular and the Christian evolutionism. Both scripture and reason must be abandoned for such an unholy union. It is not acceptable to abandon either scripture or reason. But there is also science. Example. Pepperdine's 2014 lectures scholars all seemed firmly convinced of our simian ancestry. Maybe because, among other things, they had uncritically swallowed the urban legend of 95% plus similarity of human-chimp DNA. But why abandon critical thinking when evidence supporting Genesis is at your fingertips in this cyber age? Case in point, in August 2013, Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins of the Institute of Creation Research found a big reporting gap for chimp-human DNA similarity as reported technically versus what the public generally hears. In Tompkins' ICR follow-up study for the chimp autosomes, the amount of optimally aligned DNA sequence provided similarities between 66 and 76 percent. Depending on the chromosomes, 70 percent of the chimpanzee DNA was similar to human under the most optimal alignment conditions. And so these are among the reasons I presented the following discussion at the True Science for Theologians 2015 conference.
When one dispenses with the biblical account of creation, especially that man is made in the image of God, I was totally stunned. I'll tell you, I, I guess I, I need to name the name. It was uh, Professor Chris Hurd here at Pepperdine last year. And one, in one part of his talks, he, he named his uh, children, uh, at least two sons, maybe I've forgotten which, but he said, well, here they're Bible we gave them Bible names. Those are my children. And very properly, I was glad to hear that had enough respect for his children to give them Bible names, respect both for his children and for the Word of God and, and for the history in the Bible. But another point along the way, he described um, the creation. And when it said, God made man in his image, he said, you must understand this is not a description of the nature of man. It's a job description. So our job description uh, is, was to tend the garden and just take care of the vines and the fruit and so on, keep everything pruned. But it wasn't really to bear the image of God. That's not the story of the Bible. God has invested his image. Invested is a real word. We invested our own, our time and our energy into our children. Uh, God has invested his image in us. It's, a, it's the, the greatest investment that God has made in all of his creation. Being made in the image of God is not a job description. It's a description of the great value of human dignity. So here's a list of a few things that I find in the scripture. Uh, three of these talk about the uh, specifically... Uh, being sourced in the, uh, being made in the image of God, and some just say because God has created. We can't murder a man who is made in God's image. There in Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, it's very specific. This is the reason for capital punishment. It says here, because in the image of God, God made man. And so, it's the image of God in man that is inviolable by man unless it's under God's divine law, for example, the divine law of, of punishment for murder or other things. We're not permitted to oppress a man who's made by God. Um, I've got the footnotes down below. These are in the Proverbs. We can't mock or gloat over a man made by God. If he is your enemy and he suffers terrible failure, don't gloat. Don't gloat. Don't gloat. God will take care of that person in his way. It's not our business to take care of someone who is mocking or disobeying God. Uh, but we offer sympathy because we also are clay. We also are, are clay. But our spirit is not clay. We're, we're housed in clay. You know? We have to treat workers well because the boss and the worker all are made by God. That's what uh, Job said. We can't speak evil of man who's made in God's image. I think this is in James. So because it says, from the same well does, does bitter water and sweet water come forth? And we can't even worry. Uh, he who beautifies the field cares for man even more. So all of these things which, which we understand, these are the foundations of Judeo-Christian society. These are, these are the foundations of the inherent value of man, not because my clay came together in a, in a more organized way than your claim, clay came together, so I could do engineering and you can just sweep the floor. It's not like that at all. Each person bears the image of God with dignity, but also with responsibility that comes from that. And it's uh, 5 o'clock, I think it's time.